get ready to have your moral intuitions, let's say, violated. According to Paul, at least, biblical slavery is not as bad as it sounds, as most apologists are very keen to point out. In this video, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've got Paul Copan here again but we're gonna actually be reacting to a video that we've had a lot of people sending in through email online saying, what about these questions? What about these concerns? So we're gonna kind of use this video as a jumping off point to get into some of these deep and challenging issues in the Old Testament. In our capitalist society, transactions are commonplace. We can trade notes for ice cream, sign up for a Patreon subscription to our favorite YouTube channels, and even sell card games. Ain't capitalism great? Well, to further illustrate this simple, uncoerced trade, let's see what insight Paul offers. So, you know, and sometimes the language of the Old Testament will talk about selling, talk about, uh, you know, possess, and so forth. Well, don't be misled here, because what is happening is that the, the language of a legal transaction is being utilized, and I'm not saying that being a, you know, having a, a ser position of servitude in Israel was something to be you know, delighted about, that it wasn't hard, that you didn't have hard chores to do and so forth, but it meant that once you were done with your contract, you were free. Think of sports players. They are traded. They are sold. They have agents to take care of these transactions, these owners of these franchises. You know, why doesn't that sound crass? Are these, you know, you know, is LeBron James just a piece of furniture or farm equipment here? No, that's just the language. It's just the, the, the nature of these legal transactions. That's how it goes. You hear that? You get it? You know all those verses in the Bible telling us that we can buy slaves, hit slaves, force children into slavery, and what have you. Well, it's a mistake for us to be thinking about those slaves as slaves. They're more like athletes entering a legal contract. It's all perfectly fine. Don't you just hate it when all these bloody atheists come up with these ridiculous notions about owning people as somehow being wrong, when in fact their favourite sport teams today own people? God, they're such hypocrites. Except, no. Something is telling me that this isn't a perfect analogy. I might even call it a false analogy. I mean, LeBron James earns an annual average salary of $49,511,644. And I might be wrong here, so don't quote me, but despite inflation, this seems a little more than what the slaves were earning in Israel. I don't have the exact figures, of course, but as far as I can tell, at least, it's kind of interesting that here, uh, Stephen Woodford, our uh, Rationality Rules host, and uh, the person who is uh, whom he's going to be uh, citing and uh, bringing on the program, Joshua Bowen, uh, they are both appalled that I'm bringing LeBron James into this and referring to this language of trading and owning and selling and so forth as though you know, LeBron James is just on the same level as an Israelite servant. My point here is that, you know, and they spend a lot of time, I should say, they spend a lot of time saying, oh, I can't believe Paul Copan would say these sorts of things. This is just outrageous. They're missing my point. One, I said that there are harsh severe, difficult things that people have to do in this agrarian society. It's backbreaking work, you know, olive presses, digging wells, and so forth, as, uh, as, uh, as Stephen mentions uh, later on in his uh, video. I'm not denying that. I said it's, it, it's tough. My point is not economic here. It's not talking about the economic level of LeBron James versus the Israelite servant. The issue is linguistic, and that's where they just really ignore that kind of a question. The issue is linguistic. This transactional language has something that brings together LeBron James and the Israelite servant, namely language of selling, language of acquiring, but without denying the humanity of the person who is traded, uh, as it were, uh, LeBron James, or uh, sells himself or uh, is acquired, that this is not denying their humanity. And so my fundamental point is that in, when we're talking about servitude in Israel, 
there is, you know, at, at heart, when we talk about servant, it, it's a dynamic dependency relationship. That is at the heart of what servant means here. And LeBron James is in a, a dynamic dependency relationship with the team that owns him. Uh, and, uh, and so a person who is a servant in Israel is in a dynamic dependency relationship in this contractual arrangement like indentured servitude where you are impoverished and you uh, have a six year period of time in which you serve and then your debt is cleared and you are free to get about and move around in society like uh, a, a normal person citizen who doesn't have those contractual obligations anymore. So, so again, that's the, the fundamental point. So, uh, so I'm not trying to talk about, you know, how LeBron James, uh, who has room to move about and so forth, and the Israelite servant has less of those, op fewer of those options. You know, we'll come back to that. But, but my point here is they're, they're going way off track, talking about the economic disparity and, and the hard work that the Israelite servant has, has before him or her, uh, as opposed to LeBron. James, who's living a pretty cushy life, although I'm not denying that's hard work to be a, 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 a highly talented uh, NBA player. So that's where I think we need to kind of pause and say, hold on a minute, uh, don't get off on this faulty comparison here. Uh, there's something uh, more that need that that I'm that something more essential that I'm trying to address here. And by dynamic dependency, does that what does that mean? Mutually beneficial or no? In other words, it's you know there is this uh, this uh, this contract. Uh, that is that is understood and that there is this uh, you know this dynamic relationship I think of say something like you know there's room for say negotiation and we'll we'll come back to this issue of the the person who says I love my quote master the person who's employing me the person with whom I have a contract Exodus 21 says and I want to stay on with this person because this is a, a, a very secure arrangement that I have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so th there is a certain dynamism that is also there too, that it's, it's not just, you know, you know, this set arrangement, uh, that, that can't be further say extended. So there's a dynamism to it. There's also a certain relational dynamic in terms of how in Israel, a person who is a servant in, in, in Israel, as John Golden Gay says, is actually, it's like part of the family, he says. So, he, you know, this res highly respected Old Testament scholar says to be a servant in someone's household is to be part of that household. It's, it is like being a member of the family. So, so those things ought to be considered. So there's that, that kind of dynamism too, that it's not simply a matter of a contractual arrangement, but, th but there certainly is clearly a dependency relationship where you sign this contract and you have certain obligations to fulfill to this person, just like LeBron James has a, an obligation to fulfill his contract uh, with his team. I was thinking about the military. Yeah. Isn't that a scenario where people basically say, I'm going, I'm entering into this thing yeah. and I'm committed to it. I'm, uh, you know, in a different country for a certain amount of time and it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I think a big issue, a big push for, uh, for Steven in this video is, you know, to be, to, to be what you really ought to be is to be free not to have this backbreaking work and so forth to be free and not to be miserable or feeling oppressed or whatever. Well, I think that doesn't actually apply to a lot of things in our society. And one of them is the, the army where you sign on, you contract yourself out to the army, you're you know, indentured uh, in some, to some degree, and that you have certain obligations to fulfill. And it may be miserable, you may have a uh, commanding officer who is ruthless and cruel and so forth. And yeah, that's, those are some things that you have signed up for, as it were, not you know, unknowingly, of course, but you agree to the terms and you may not know all the implications, but there can be certain levels of severity and lack of mobility. Say if you get married, you can't say, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the army, but I got married, so they ought to give me leave and so forth. Well, no, those are the, just the things that you take on when you are in the army. Uh, and if you're under contract in Israel, you get married, well, you 
you can leave after your contract is done if you've gotten married in the middle of this transaction and wait until that person is, 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 is yeah, that contract is fulfilled. Uh, or you can perhaps arrange some other uh, matter, maybe just even staying on in that household. Uh, but but you know, as Deuteronomy 15 says, whether a person is a male or a female servant, once the six years is done, then it is completed and that you are to load that person up with provisions, uh, not to be grudging in your heart that you're letting this servant go, uh, but actually to, to give that person provisions to send that person on uh, his or her way. Uh, and when that is violated, we see in, in, in Jeremiah, there, Jeremiah actually calls out the people of Israel for holding on to servants longer than six years. And, and, and there is a, you know, and indeed a judgment on the, you know, on the Israelites, the people of Judah, uh, because of that. So, so there is a, a call to hold the line on that and not to say, oh, you don't have, you know, any sort of mobility, you can't move, you're stuck in this situation forever. That's the implication that you get sometimes, you know, when you, when, in this discussion, this video uh, with, uh, with uh, Stephen and also Joshua Bowen who uh, enters into this discussion. So those are a few things to, to, to bring to, to mind as well. That the, I think the army is a good uh, peril even our, for our own modern day, that there are some things that people sign up for they're committed, they may not like it, it may put them into a very difficult situation, but these are the things that you've agreed to and you can't always get out of them. And in the same way in ancient Israel, you can't always get out of it, there may be difficult circumstances and I certainly acknowledge that in what I said. Pressing olives, digging wells, cooking and cleaning for food and shelter isn't quite the same as receiving the best medical and nutritional products and services available to bounce around a ball for millions of dollars. LeBron is also not, as far as I can tell, subjugated to beatings with a wooden rod. In any case, according to Paul at least, biblical slavery is not as bad as it sounds. As most apologists are very keen to point out, biblical slavery was nothing like antebellum slavery. When it comes to being, say, beaten with a rod, uh, there is this assumption that you can do whatever you want with your servant. And one of this, of course, probably referring to Exodus 21, uh, where this is discussing if a, if a uh, you know, an employer slash master um, strikes his servant so that he dies, then it says he will be avenged. So he may be using a rod, it's not as though this is being, say, endorsed as though this is the, the way that a, a servant uh, is to be treated or this is the way that uh, an, you know, the contracted uh, employer uh, is to treat his servant, that this is normative. It's simply being descriptive, and this mm -hmm. is what case law is about in the Old Testament. If someone steals something, well, what do you do? Uh, if someone kills someone, what do you do? It's not saying, oh, that it's okay, that we have a law to cover that, and, uh, you know, no, there is dealing with things that are descriptive, and, and how do you deal with those sorts of situations? Well, if someone strikes a servant so that he dies, it says that person will be avenged. That is kind of a, a classic description of the death penalty, that there is death that comes because you have taken an innocent person's life. So rather than saying, oh, the servant is a, a piece of property, it's actually showing regard for that servant, that that servant had rights and dignity, that person has been made in the image of God, but yet that person who struck him did not regard that as such, and so took his life, and that therefore that person's life ought to be taken. And so you have the death penalty that is being implemented here for a person, not a piece of property. Some people might say, doesn't the text go on to say that if he survives a day or two, then there is no, you know, you know that there is no death penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, that person, you know, is not, you know, that the, it's assumed that that person didn't intentionally try to kill, and therefore uh, that that person is not uh, perhaps penalized. Well. We're not told that. We're not told that he isn't penalized. Rather, we're, you know, and there would be a penalty. In fact, in that same chapter, if you knock out the tooth or you gouge out the eye of a servant, the servant is to be let go. So it's not as though you can do whatever you want with that person. 
uh, that there are certain rights that that person has. And if you maim that person, that person is to go free. And so if that person ends up not dying until after a day or two, keep in mind that it's not as though you can pulverize that person to within an inch of his life. As I said, judges know how to assess things and that there is, you know, that there are penalties for manslaughter as well, which this would be. We're just not told what that is, but it says, you know, but this also comes in the context of accidental injuries. Just take a look at the pre preceding context. What do you do when there is an accidental injury? Now it's not saying accidental injuries are okay. Those are normative. You can go ahead and do whatever you want. No, it's saying in the case, in case this happens, what do you do? Well, in the previous incident that there is a reference to medical fees mm -hmm. that are being paid for someone who has, you know, has been you know, injured, uh, for someone who is taking care of those medical fees. And the same, th you know, and, and Harry Hoffner of the University of Chicago, a noted Hittitologist, studied the Hittites, he said that there's a parallel Hittite law that, that, that says that if there's a medical fee, that the person who has brought injury is to pay for those medical fees. And, and Harry Hofner argues that this actually carries over into this context as well, saying that, the, you know, it says, that is his silver, or some, people, some translations say he is his silver, um, that servant, uh, he is his silver. What does that mean? Well, some, some translations say he is his property. Well, no, it just means that there is, yes, a transaction involved. You are sustaining that person. You're investing in this person, in you know, this indentured servant. And so if you bring a harm to that servant, then you're only losing your, on your own investment. So that person is a silver. Harry Hofner says the, you know, he could also be referring to the medical payment. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a pronoun. What is it referring to? Is it referring to that servant or is it referring to the previous context of the medical fee? And so if the judge sees that some, that the person who has struck the servant so that he, you know, if, you know, dies after a day or two, if he is, if he, uh, you know, he, the judge sees that this was not intentional and that the person who has struck him is actually using money to pay for the medical fees, then that would go into considering the final judgment on what to do with this person because he's shown goodwill in trying to address this injury that he has brought about. Uh, so, so, and it shows that it was, this was not intentional, uh, that, it, that it was not murder, but it was, it was manslaughter, that it was an accidental death, and that there are ways of addressing that within Israel in terms of various forms of compensation. But, but that's the broader context that is going on here. So the idea that, oh, you can beat someone to within an inch of his life, uh, and if he dies, well, that doesn't matter. It doesn't, no, it doesn't say that that person doesn't get penalized, but it does indicate that that person was not, uh, you know, was not struck with, uh, with intent to murder. And so that there are things that need to be done, protocols to follow in light of that, and including certain remunerations to the family of that servant, et cetera, uh, that that is taken care of. So that's a little bit more of the context and uh, trying to clarify that beating someone with a rod issue. The distinction that you made between what is descriptive and what is prescriptive, I think is huge mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times people read something in the Old Testament and they say, this is what God is asking mm -hmm. people to do or mm -hmm. commanding people to do right. or, or even just, I don't know, like allowing for it and not mm -hmm. punishing in any way. Mm -hmm. Right. But to say, but to, to read the Old Testament with that in mind, I think mm -hmm. is very important. Like, no, yeah. this is a description mm -hmm. of moral failure mm -hmm. on the behalf of people. Very often mm -hmm. that's what it is. And you actually see God contending with that moral failure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and, and a lot of those different stories, people say, how is, how are his patriarchs have, and how is it? And there's so many instances in the old mm -hmm. Testament that you can look at extreme human moral failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you read that as this is what God wants his people to do, see, these are God's people. These are God's prophets. These are mm -hmm. God's Kings. These are God's mm -hmm. Uh, you know, patriarchs and look at what they're doing. So mm -hmm. God condones all of this rather than no, this is a description of human moral mm -hmm. failure. Mm -hmm. God contends with it and ultimately mm -hmm. is pulling people out of it yeah. in, the, in the long view. So I just think that's a, that's a huge point. Yeah. I do think that someone maybe more skeptical or, mm -hmm. or a seeker could listen to this conversation, could, could, you know, watch this video that we're reacting to. And there might be just a fundamental question that could arise that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, which is, um, why not say the Israelites have been freed out of Egyptian slavery mm -hmm. and no more 
slavery at all going mm -hmm. forward like no version of servitude mm -hmm. no nothing like that what yeah. what would be what would be your response to something like that yeah. just in, in terms of why didn't he just draw like a hard line yeah. in the sand mm -hmm. and yeah. say nothing even remotely similar to what we just got out of in egypt yeah three dozen times in the law of moses the lord is saying that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt. That are, and so you are to treat the alien in your midst with care and compassion. So the foreigner in your midst, you are to show regard for them because you were once you know, slaves, in, you know, servants, you know, uh, you know, harshly treated in the land of Egypt. So there is that connection that God is trying to draw that you are not to replicate those sorts of things in Israel, mm. which means that you see servitude in Israel with another perspective, that if this is the undercurrent of the Mosaic law, that God, you know, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and then you know, the 10 commandments come in Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods before me and so forth. God has brought them out, he's saying, I've done this for you, now this is how you are to live in light of that redemption, that act of grace with a spirit of gratitude and so forth. So here is the covenant being made with that as the backdrop. Are we then gonna say, oh, therefore God wants to just bring that you know, slavery, you know, the harsh oppression right back into Israel? No, I think that's reading the, the law of Moses with a skewed lens saying, oh, look at that verse, that looks pretty suspicious. And then you basically nix or reject all of these other texts that say, don't oppress, look out for the alien in your midst, love the alien in your midst and so forth. Well, then you say, oh, you know, uh, those sorts of critics who are charging uh, Israelite law with all these terrible things, look at this. I think they're losing the, the, the larger undercurrent that undergirds the Old Testament's law that reminds the people, avoid that oppression. So it, it's also, secondly, a, it's not just a matter of you know, not reinstitutionalizing slavery mm -hmm. you know, of, of Israelites and foreigners in, in Israel, but their attempts to actually allow people opportunity to stay out of servitude, because what brings people into servitude? It's basically poverty. Mm -hmm. And so you have, for example, gleaning laws where the poor of the land can glean, like Ruth does uh, in the book of Ruth, gleaning in the fields of Boaz, gathering grain. Not everything has been cut down, but there are the edges of the field or uh, fruit left on the trees that you can pick that the poor of the land can, can work for their, work for their you know, food, as it were, uh, but also have some kind of general provision for them in order to keep them out of servitude. Uh, you know, that there's, an, there's this limit of six years uh, of servitude for those who do contract themselves out, quote, sell themselves into servitude. Uh, you know, and, and, and then once that is done, they ought to be given lavish uh, provisions as Deuteronomy 15 says, whether male or female, and that this is to, uh, you know, they're to be freed from those debts. Rather than keeping them in this position of servitude, God is saying, no, let them go. You're not to institutionalize servitude. So, so that, those are a few things. We'll come to Leviticus 25 in a bit um, mm -hmm. you know, in this conversation. And so we, we go into more detail on that point. Uh, but there are certain provisions and, and God is basically just regulating mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the matter of servitude. He's not, he's not trying to institutionalize. And I think it's important that we remember the difference between institutionalizing and regulating. Regulating means to prevent abuses, to prevent people from going into servitude in the first place, encouraging people who are, or have relatives who have means to buy them out of prospective servitude and so forth. So you have all these provisions uh, that are being made for the Israelites to keep them from getting further and further into poverty and then remaining in this uh, position of servitude. The standard of living is so high for us today. Mm -hmm. Anybody watching this YouTube video, anybody watching this YouTube mm -hmm. video has such a comfortable life and such a high standard of living that we measure all of these scenarios in the ancient Near East against and everything appears terrible, brutal, mm -hmm. barbaric. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that it's really easy to look down your nose at any of these scenarios from a comfortable Mm -hmm. more moral high yeah, ground yeah, but yeah. really a, a tremendous amount of privilege and to mm -hmm. say what's going you know what's going on with this or that this is all this is all completely crazy mm -hmm. not realizing that we're that the world at that time was a world of conflict a world mm -hmm. of poverty a world of warring nations mm 
throughout a lot of these stories, the Israelites were actually nomadic. Mm -hmm. And you look at that and it's like, there's no, there's no version of this scenario that is going to lead to as high of a quality of life for anybody. Mm -hmm. It's just a different world. It's either right. that these women and children are, are left inside of a city where they're vulnerable to other people who can come along and there's all kinds of downsides to that or that, or it's that they're brought into Israel and there's some caveats and there's some ways that God is mitigating against their harsh treatment within Israel. Mm -hmm. But in either scenario, we're talking about, we're talking about really, really hard times mm -hmm. in human history. Sure. And I just think that that's important to, to have at the forefront of this is mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very lazy to just measure everything from the modern privilege that we have today. Mm -hmm. And then to say, Oh, well, look at this. There's this one thing that's bad there. And this one thing, mm -hmm. this all just sounds barbaric. And why didn't they just choose to live in a, a you know, a three, two with a, with a white picket fence. What's wrong with these people? Why yeah. is God so harsh against humans? Yeah. You know, hard to improve on what you've said. And it's what CS Lewis said when he talked about chronological snobbery, where it's easy to be uh, to kind of look down upon that pr previous era. Look at how bad those things were. Look at how terrible life was back then. If we lived back then, we would have done it totally differently. And that just does not, uh, show a charitable and sympathetic understanding of how history develops, economies develop, how mindsets develop, and that we, as we look at what's going on in ancient Israel, we see God stepping into this situation and giving Israel a much improved mindset in terms of the equality, fundamental equality of all people, made in the image of God, uh, male and female, uh, no hierarchy. Israel is basically seen as a democratized society that, you know, that brothers and sisters, that's how you look at each other. And that even the foreigner and the Israelite were to operate under the same rules in Israel. So you see, you know, that, that you know, it's not optimal, but there is at least this, uh, this effort to legislate uh, to such a degree that you see what God's ideals are pointing beyond some of the realities on the ground to remembering the creation uh, framework of male and female equality, fundamental social equality, and so forth. Uh, you know, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. A second thing to keep in mind is, you know, what, what Deuteronomy exhorts the people of Israel to, to note that, that if they follow the law that God has given to them, Yes, there are certain things that are permitted, Jesus said in Matthew 19, uh, you know, because of the hardness of human hearts. So it's not as though this is the perfect legislation, universal for all time, but there, the kinds of worldview differences exhibited in the law of Moses are far greater than what we see in other ancient Near Eastern cultures surrounding Israel. Mm -hmm. When it comes to say, you know, the hierarchy, of, you know, in, in a lot of these ancient Near Eastern nations, you know, the hierarchy that you have in society and punishments that are more severe for those who are lower status than those for upper status. That's not true in Israel. You have a fundamental law that respects human dignity and worth over property. Whereas in the ancient Near Eastern societies, they had the law of property over persons, that property was more important than, than personhood. You have, provisions made in Israel for the poor so that they don't get further into poverty and you don't have to charge them interest. Well, in nations surrounding Israel, mm. high interest rates were, were the thing. It kept people in poverty. Uh, you know, the servitude class was institutionalized. Uh, again, far different from what is, the, what, what is the effort in Israel to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a concern for those who are foreigners. And of course, Israel has the narrative to care for the foreigners in your midst. You didn't have those kinds of provisions for foreigners in other ancient Near Eastern lands. So on and on it goes. I spent two chapters in my book, Is God a Vindictive Bully, talking about these remarkable worldview differences. And often the critics, like I said, they'll hone in on, what about that verse there? And they'll ignore all of these remarkable provisions mm -hmm. that, are, that are made for Israel. And, and as Deuteronomy says, that when the, if you're practicing these things, the nations around you will say, wow, what a wise and understanding people those Israelites are. And, 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 but of course, they didn't live up to uh, that sort of a thing, but, but that was the intent. That was the goal that God sought to meet them where they are and then move them in a redemptive direction. Mm -hmm.